Mark 10, 1 to 12. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, ask, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The opening verse of this passage shows us the patient perseverance of our Lord Jesus Christ as a teacher. We are told that Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Wherever our Lord went, he was always about his father's business, preaching, teaching, and laboring to do good to souls. He threw away no opportunity. In the whole history of his earthly ministry, we never read of an idle day. Of him it may be truly said that he sowed beside all waters, and that in the morning he sowed his seed, and in the evening withheld not his hand. Isaiah 32.20, Ecclesiastes 11.6 And yet our Lord knew the hearts of all men. He knew perfectly well that the great proportion of his hearers were hardened and unbelieving. He knew, as he spoke, that most of his words fell to the ground, uncared for, and unheeded, and that so far as concerned the salvation of souls, most of his labor was in vain. He knew all this, and yet he labored on. Let us see in this fact a standing pattern to all who try to do good to others, whatever their office may be. Let it be remembered by every minister and every missionary, by every schoolmaster and every Sunday school teacher, by every district visitor and every lay agent, by every head of a house who has family prayers, and by every caretaker who has the charge of children. Let all such remember Christ's example and resolve to do likewise. We are not to give up teaching because we see no good done. 
we are not to relax our exertions because we see no fruit of our toil. We are to work on steadily, keeping before us the great principle that duty is ours and results are God's. There must be plowmen and sowers as well as reapers and binders of sheaves. The honest master pays his laborers according to the work they do and not according to the crops that grow on his land. Our master in heaven will deal with all his servants at the last day in like manner. He knows that success is not in their hands. He knows that they cannot change hearts. He will reward them according to their labor and not according to the fruits which have resulted from their labor. It is not the good and successful servant, but the good and faithful servant to whom he will say, Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 25, 21 The greater portion of this passage is meant to show us the dignity and importance of marriage. It is plain that the prevailing opinions of the Jews upon this subject, when our Lord was upon earth, were lax and low in the extreme. The binding character of the marriage tie was not recognized. Divorce for slight and trivial causes was allowable and common. The duties of husbands towards wives and of wives towards husbands, as a natural consequence, were little understood. To correct this state of things, our Lord sets up a high and holy standard of principles. He refers to the original institution of marriage at creation as the union of one man and one woman. He quotes and endorses the solemn words used at the marriage of Adam and Eve as words of perpetual significance. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. He adds a solemn Comment to these words. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And finally, in reply to the inquiry of his disciples, he declares that divorce followed by remarriage, except for the cause of unfaithfulness, is a breach of the seventh commandment. The importance of the whole subject on which our Lord here pronounces judgment can hardly be overrated. We ought to be very thankful that we have so clear and full an exposition of his mind upon it. The marriage relationship lies at the very root of the social system of nations. The public morality of a people and the private happiness of the families which compose a nation are deeply involved in the whole question of the law of marriage. The experience of all nations confirms the wisdom of our Lord's decision in this passage in the most striking manner. It is a fact clearly ascertained that polygamy and permission to obtain divorce on slight grounds have a direct tendency to promote immorality. In short, 
the nearer a nation's laws about marriage approach to the law of Christ, the higher has the moral tone of that nation always proved to be. It becomes all those who are married or purpose marriage to ponder well the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in this passage. Of all relations of life, none ought to be regarded with such reverence and none taken in hand so cautiously as the relation of husband and wife. In no relation is so much earthly happiness to be found if it be entered upon discreetly, advisedly, and in the fear of God. In none is so much misery seen to follow if it be taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, wantonly, and without thought. From no step in life does so much benefit come to the soul if people marry in the Lord. From none does the soul take so much harm if fancy, passion, or any mere worldly motive is the only cause which produces the union. Solomon was the wisest of men. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Nehemiah 13.26 There is unhappily only too much necessity for impressing these truths upon people. It is a mournful fact that few steps in life are generally taken with so much levity, self-will, and forgetfulness of God as marriage. Few are the young couples who think of inviting Christ to their wedding. It is a mournful fact that unhappy marriages are one great cause of the misery and sorrow of which there is so much in the world. People find out too late that they have made a mistake and go into bitterness all their days. Happy are they who in the matter of marriage observe three rules. The first is to marry only in the Lord and after prayer for God's approval and blessing. The second is not to expect too much from their partners, and to remember that marriage is, after all, the union of two sinners, and not of two angels. The third rule is to strive first and foremost for one another's sanctification. The more holy married people are, the happier they are. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26